The following is a talk I had with Tony Blake at Portland, Oregon, whilst we were attending the All and Everything Conference 2018. Now this uh, situation is where I'm, my name is Anthony Blake, I'm with my friend Debbie who's recording and giving me moral support and other kinds of support to um, fulfill a little bit or assuage some of my frustration in coming to this all and everything conference and I thought I would work out, work up a paper about some aspect of Gurdjieff's work that I w wasn't allowed to do so. Um, so she said, why not take this chance, you know, we could still do something and record it and make use of it. And I thought that was a very good solution. That's right. And you said it'd be the alternative conference. Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> It was a, just a very minor minority group, you know, two people, of uh, being naughty and playing truant. That's it. We should but be at a seminar, but we're not. I'm sure we would be taken to task by somebody or other if they joined in all of this. But the, this, but this, just our simple coming together. Before the recording started, I had this picture kind of came to my mind of uh, because there have been papers about, well, they're all about all and everything, Gurdjieff's book. And it suddenly struck me about this picture of poor Mr. God at the beginning of everything, on his own, as we say in English, on his Todd. You know. And um, suddenly, the first time I thought him, he must have been um, a little bit um, sad, or I don't know, using those silly anthropomorphic terms. But what a difference it is when somebody else comes into the room. You know, and then you can have this conversation. And of course, all the main religions have given expression to that in so many ways, you know, including the idea that God was felt lonely. Or some of the early cosmologists were very much like this, even African ones. You see, the spirit, I think, was alone. So sort of wanted to have a companion. So he created, or it created. So, yeah, he had to create. And Gurdjieff refers to it in a, quite a complex way in the third series of of, um, of a further amplification of it is literally separating himself from his beloved son in this kind of thing and uh, to make it a very strong thing and why have that insistence for separation because that is the occasion or the incentive for something new and interesting it's a bit like you know some in some of the Christian traditions, um, the expulsion from Eden and so on is celebrated as a wonderful positive event. Why? Because it necessitated Christ would be born on earth to redeem it, you see. And there is a sense in which only by things going wrong, as somebody was mentioning in our previous talk, can there be something really new. Because if it all went right, there would be nothing new. It would just be continuous. Yeah. The same again, love. Mm -hmm. you know, as it was. The it, same things happening in Eden every day. They wandered the gardens, <laughs> that's had their right. fruit. Exactly. Had the angels sing to them. <laughs> Absolutely. Gosh, you know, I wonder what it was. I'm going off on a tangent now that. Um, even people like Milton wondered about their sex life in Eden, what it would have been like if you had all the troubles outside of Eden. And they, these people were actually think, trying to imagine what sex in Eden was like, you know. <laughs> but you think but they need it, though, because they were already in bliss. That's right. There's no, in a sense, no incentive you know, <laughs> to do that, to get some recompense from the toils of life and, and the troubles of life and so on. But then, yeah. So, and you know, I mentioned separation, and I was very intrigued to learn once that, you know, you talk about um, chaos and creation, that kind of thing. You know, but he, I learned some, from somewhere that the original meaning of this word chaos was not disorder, it was a gap or void. Mm -hmm. And so I can, and look at all the early creation myths, and they're all about many of them have this separation between earth and sky. 
and there was a void in between. Void in between? Yes. Then it gets interesting. So you get a first stage of creation, which is setting up the separation, and the second about what goes into it and all the argy bargy and trouble and strife which happens happens in it. Okay. So because in most everything comes from nothing, which would be that void. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, of course, Gurdjieff accentuated it practically. He said, must make vacuum. And that's one of the greatest arts in life, make a vacuum. Don't just keep on down the same rat wheel, whatever it is, you know, mm -hmm. the same circuit, you know, round and round, you're trying to deal with life. And it, you know what it is, we, we're just in recurrent machines, and say the time again. To make a break, make a stop, make a something like that. So how can you make um, a stop, a break? Because this is for me the I've got my theme here of reconciliation. You see, um, contributes to I think a richer understanding of reconciliation because it's. There's one simplistic view of it, or I call it simplistic from my judgment. That is to say, well. You get a conflict as something which a lot of people regard as negative and use that word negative about it. There's disagreement, discord, conflict, and so on. But then this reconciliation comes in and it's all happy, which is. Bliss. <laughs> Pardon? The bliss. The bliss. Well, it's a kind of um, <laughs> soppy bliss, if I put it that way, you know. It's um, because then you think, ah, that's all over then. Um, but what if I take a, a different stance uh, and saying that, well, when you get the this uh, kind of reconciliation, uh, this I'm struggling at this moment to find another kind of word. Because the reconciliation is mean, okay, we get this agreement, we get this peace, we sign the peace treaty, uh, we sort things out and all the rest of it. But what if it is um, something which actually, almost in a sense, amplifies that discord in the first place? Not to call it discord, but that difference. Because you've got to have this difference, you see. It's like, a weak example is two different points of view, or something like that, you see. But there might be other better examples, and you know, so the reconciliation comes in to enable them to, to stand together. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Because only in life, I would say, and often we get that kind of differences, you know, they, the one and the other they kind of divorce themselves from each other, or shut the other one out or try to, you know, they can get very painful in a relationship and, and so on, but uh, they can't. So what could happen, for example, is say if you had a difference and a conflict and therefore you have an energy, and that's part of the, I think, the positive role of reconciliation, and you don't want to do this energy, but there has to be this component of enabling people to bear it. Because I found in my work, you know, the interest in dialogue and so on, that often I feel that most of us don't, most of the time, don't really, don't really, really uh, experience and recognize that we think differently. You know, we give lip service, of course, you know, Debbie, you think differently from me about, you know, mm -hmm. sure we do, we, we can each has her own opinions and all this sort of but when it comes to actually being in the same space about the same issue, then I found it, you know, people are astonished. You could, and why? Isn't it because people want to be the same. They feel secure if they're in so doing the, core, the same yes, thing absolutely. with everybody else. I'm one of them. That's it. Being part yeah. of the herd. Yeah. And we're not. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is like, we're in a position then of a failed God, because we come to the, uh, the other and we just want to deny it, so to speak, and, <laughs> or yes. suppress it. And you even get that in certain religions. It's like, well, the, 
world's all gone wrong, you see, and we got all these angels and messengers to put it right. What the hell would putting it right mean? So it means that the, like there's a lovely image in the Sumerian epic, Enuma Elish, which means when on high, and it's the first line of the poem, when on high the gods had not been formed, and so on. It says things had not been formed, things had not been made, and it's talking about the beginning of the universe, but it reaches a stage where we've got these protagonists, the two main ones are Tiamat, which is the bitter waters of the ocean, and Apsu, the sweet waters of the abyss, and they generate the gods, but then the gods surge around, around and make clamor, and upset Tiamat, <laughs> and so they threatened to exterminate them. You see, but there's a strong upstart there who prevents this extermination, <laughs> and therefore we have the world. But that's a picture of this warfare, so to speak, because difference, and as Sakharov, difference is difficult to bear. Mm -hmm. um, there seems to be a striving for everyone to be the same, even in modern life, don't they? They oh, the same yes. house, same get a Conf job. Conformism is right, yeah. isn't it? You know. You get these pseudo choices now, you know, a thousand channels, TV channels, it's all the same kind of mediocrity and this kind of thing. So here, how can we stand together? And uh, I think, I would suppose, and I believe that a lot of interesting things could have happened when you get people who are really different to work together, for example, you see. And so what comes in? We start by my, one of my favorite mystical things, of course, is saying of Christ, when two or three are gathered together in my name, then am I with them? Which is a most beautiful expression. It is, if you want to say, what well, is kind of an additional member of the little gathering, but um, not to add to the complexity, so to speak, but to make the meaning of their gathering different. The, it's, and so it's giving them an ableness, this ableness to bear, you know, to bear a difference. And it's, a, it's a very interesting thing. So the, you don't only get the, the gap, the separation, but also this enablement. Now, when I was with um, I somehow felt I went with Mr. Bennett and picked up from him, so I can't give a specific references and so on because it was so accepted about our situation. Even though it's said in some of Goethe's phrases, we are in need of um, ableness, it's to be able. Mr. Bennett made a whole concept out of this, he called hypoxis, but we won't go there in this conversation. Uh, but it's like, you may, go to a straight forward, you want to do this, you want to be a good person, whatever it is, but are you able to be a good person? And where do you get the ableness from? And there's also this puzzle, you know, because you can't quite pull yourself up by your bootlaces, love. <laughs> so, what is it? You get a freebie, and that's called divine grace, which is a freebie, you see. Or do you get a kind of loan? as in certain traditions they say you can borrow some baraka as long as you pay it back, because baraka is a term for this ableness. Um, and this is, when I started talking, it was around trying to feel my way towards, um, you know, rethinking or re feeling this primary word of reconciliation, which is, may not be peaceful in this simplistic way, but uh, preserves the energy, because there is indifference and energy. Mm, yes, there is. You know, it's a bit of, you see all, what do you, he used to say, it go to the friction, and friction, and you can light a fire with it. But the management and organization of this comes from something else. But do you think that energy is quite subtle, and that's why people miss it? No, I think they, um, what they get involved in is discharging it. Ah, oh, okay. And that's another briefing, in my opinion, and the hints of it in modern neurological research about the brain, how the brain works, is the brain works to minimize what's called 
physics free energy. Now, you can see, you see, most of our lives are like routine, you see. We go out of routine, like there's a crisis, see, that's going out of routine. Now, that can have very positive outcomes. Suddenly, people are able to do all kinds of things, you know, rescue people and that kind of thing, and actually talk to each other. But there's um, another way you get energy where, which is generated and people have nothing to put it into directly, you see. So they react and you get this, you know, violence and all this kind of, which I call discharge. They have to discharge it because they're trying to reach in their brains down to equilibrium again. Mm -hmm. you know, the status quo, that's the whole tendency. So you've got to catch this. Uh, and it's like one, dozing away, and two, going, oh my God, and, and three, wow, you know, something new happens, and that's, that's more the pattern of it. But I find some people, when that something new happens, they either run with it, or they want to go back to dozing. I think that's, that's fair, that's exactly right, and the... <coughs> And because running with it involves this kind of really, if you make friends with the unknown sort of attitude in it, isn't it? You mm. must know this. You mm. know, you don't. That's the whole point. It's not the old thing again, and you guys. You know, it's got a chance of doing something different. That's great. That's really nice. Um, well, let's go to the. All this, what all I say, all the various conversations and books about the triad, which features so much in in uh, Goethe's writings, and which he made a lot of fuss about. And there's some uh, some things I like to say about this. Some preliminary things, pretty widely widely known, but the, it's how. Uh, let's paraphrase and say how in life, excuse me, the, these three elements, uh, how to express it, are... Uh, As in the affirming, the denying and the reconciling. For example, right? that's okay. right. But only become or take on those roles when they come together. So it's not as if you got, so I'm raising the question, see, well, three, okay, but the whole drama is them meeting, getting together, you see. Now, Goethe actually says they are kind of all interesting in their own right because they're independent, he says they've got to be independent. But then they come together, then they take on these roles you've just mentioned, in relation to each other, but only in relation to each other. Because there can be a tendency, you pick up this thing, active, passive, and you, like, and you attach them to things, you know what I mean, as if they were just floating around there, that's active, floating around <laughs> there, but it's not. It's only when these children come together, as they come together, it's imagine they're going, uh, you know. And, and it creates something. Creating that role. And why do you have to have that role? But, um, you can say, well, mm. One way he put it was to invent in his mythology of the planet uh, Modexerio, I think it is, where you have three sexes coming together. And, uh, he makes a, quite a lot about this, which I think is very interesting. That he emphasizes how the three coming together, you have something complete. And uh, there's a way which just the two can't manage, as there was something not complete, not sorted out with, with the two. Well, because as the two, weren't they fighting each other? They can, yes. And having that third force? <laughs> or creating well, that third force? It's like the, I don't know, what is it? I just, maybe come back to us, uh, I'm still trying to go along this sense of the, you know, the, the three elements don't start off with the, the labels on them, but then you make it mutually. And why do they make it mutual? Let's look at this, you see. It's because it's to do this 
profundity, I call it profundity, of, of difference. See, how different can difference be? How different can difference be? Yeah, it comes up in the time. You, see, you get the two coming together and they begin to between naturally there's a polarity, some kind of difference, you know, differentiation between them because they're different, you know, it's identified. The third character comes along and you think, well, what's his difference? <laughs> <laughs> you know, is he different to Mr. A in a different way to his difference with Mr. Mr. B? B. <laughs> Yeah, and so on and so on. You get this that kind of complication, and it, it's actually the subtlety because there is a, in physics this thing which attracts me a lot, interests me a lot. But a lot of people don't know about this, and it's so fascinating. It's called the three-body problem. Is you imagine yourself in empty space, and you've got two things, and they have both got mass, you see, and they can you can work out exactly what's, what what how they're going to move. You know, you can write the equation. To, but if you have three, you can't. You can't. You uh, can't predict exactly what they're going to do. Uh, for me, that's absolutely exciting, because you know, and what makes it why? If you invite it, when you said run with something new, this is the option given by the triad of uh, doing something new, because you can't really predict what's going to happen. So it's an uncertainty principle. Uncertainty comes into it, and it's you know it's, I think it's knowledge in in actually in physics and. The mathematicians deal with very special cases where you can predict, but it's only special cases. And it usually ends up with one, the, one, the third element being thrown out into infinity. So the two are left happily in the, in the cycle together. Uh, but you've got to ask, only, why am I going on about this? You know, just to get this sense of the um, it's a, it's a peculiar kind of equality between the three, which intrigues me. Because you get these labels, the active, passive, and regular. And sometimes, you know, in Gurdjieff and the early things, you could do it mechanically. So it were, the active is higher, passive is lower, and the neutralizing is in between. You come across mm -hmm. that. Yes. You know, yeah, kind of, and you can picture it, you know, this kind of thing. But let's, if you drop that, uh, because let's look at it as one of us commentators are saying. Yeah, yesterday or today, the, um, look at it subjectively, so to speak. That is to say, the, uh, the in a way, you could say the element which is active is coarser than the element which is passive. But you've got these words, you see, in you go, denying, passive, and Bennett used to like receptive. Mm -hmm. You change the words, but you change the whole color of it. Yeah, then it, the meaning becomes different, doesn't but it? That's the meaning. Isn't it? Denying, you know, you feel like there's a rocket. Receptive. Ah. Oh. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. I'll have a bit of perceptive. You're right. Yeah. And <laughs> Imagine the earth perceptive to the rain. Ah. <laughs> oh, it's not denying the rain, <laughs> this kind of thing. And, and between people, you can do that. You know, you can, uh, it comes to our conversation. You, how can you have a conversation in which there is you know, they can have this role of receptivity active in it, and, and instead of denial. And that comes again from this third factor, I think. I used to do this exercise, I gave it a special name, a dialogue with D-Y, and I said, point to something well known, is most conversations are structured by the rubric, yes, but. Because everybody likes to appear as if they agree, but really they don't. <laughs> so, say, yes, but say, so it's well, a polite way of continuing yes, to get your own opinion in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I've heard all of that, you know, but it's, what you said is crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you the, what really matters. Uh, and I say, well, let's distinguish and do yes and, and no but. And you make these quite distinctive and it's a very, quite a hard exercise because the yes and for you've got to constantly amplify what the other person has said, you think you accept it. So you, that's where the third force is there because you have to suppose there's both people in fact accept a common discipline. Mm. This kind of thing. So being receptive is, is quite something. 
And so there's, I think, an enablement in that. So it's very much not cut and dried to try and recapitulate a bit about these three elements having a certain kind of label or shape, you know, so you can say, oh, that's a, an affirming coming in now. It's like they, they touch and mold each other and, and you get these subtleties and I say these gradations, denial, passivity, receptivity. And that, and I'll be departing a bit more from well, Gurdjieff now, in uh, but with Mr. Bennett, you see, I mentioned equality, but you can ask yourself, well, of course, one can ask oneself anything, you know, ask oneself if there is equality between these three elements, what are they equal in? Yeah, interesting, yeah. And Gurdjieff simply says they're all equally active, in fact. And what Mr. Bennett said, they are all equally will. 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 W I double L. That, that boy, <coughs> will, you see. And he said, those people are not used to using the word will except as a positive force, as an active force. And so he has this terrible idea of willpower, you know, this kind of thing. But for him, no. And it was a great, had a great influence on me and I think a lot of my friends at the time. And it influenced his interpretation of the Gurdjieff work and his own spiritual path a great deal, that is to say. When he looked into, he had this idea of, like, okay, you're at this meeting together, and he introduced into, imagine three, whatever they are, jostling around, and he had to get, well, and he used a certain term, he said, which one takes the initiative? Um, he was like, wouldn't it be different, he said, if, you know, if, or what, you've got to first of all have some kind of idea of taking the initiative means. It's saying this is something quite independent from the, the characters, active, passive, reconciling, so on. And he said, it's like, it's like, you see, active force takes the initiative, this colors everything, you see. Receptive force takes the initiative, this colors everything. And so they all would color it in a certain way, because that's what's taken the initiative. It's like one of them, the three says, okay, and uh, start something off. But he was subtle in saying, well, it doesn't have to be, um, the starting it off is quite independent from the way they do it. And in particular, we got into all these sort of examples of saying how some things are started, you know, especially from the receptive force. It was a big, big thing for, and of course, his great paradigm was the Virgin Mary. And he said how oh, history was changed when she said, do it to me according to thy will. And there was, it was her act of acceptance which changed human history. And then he went into love with this. He said, look at Helen of Troy, the face that launched a thousand ships. Mm. She didn't go around waving a, a Come sword. Come and me. <laughs> <laughs> or, or even that, that's right, that's right. That's right. You know. And he said, it's interesting because you see, you look at it and the whole world tends to only pay attention to somebody who's making a noise, mm -hmm. being forceful. And so I understood, me, almost immediately, we understood, yeah, you see, things are enabled to happen because somebody's made an, had an active, receptive initiative. Now this comes out in spiritual practice. Because it's like in the Gospels, they say, knock and it shall be opened. And it's kind of, you have to knock. It won't come to you, you've got to take that part. Yeah, yeah you've got to say, like say, knock on the door. Even, please, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and you think, and it gets exciting in a way, because you see, you're like you're praying to God, whatever it is, or asking God, and you say, well, this God is infinite and you are nothing. And how does this body work? And you've got, you've got to say, Okay, please, you know, like girls say, you've got to say please, otherwise I won't give it to you. Yeah, don't sit there waiting for it to happen. That's it, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's good, just waiting for rose pigeons to find your mouth. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> like you know, you've only got to, and it's it, it really, because he, un, I mean, he really felt this, really understood, and he transmitted a lot of that to us. You know, the front of this 
infinite spiritual world, we, you can't, you need to ask. And how to ask. And this, um, I had sort of hard lesson about this with my dear late friend Ted Matchett, who was, he's actually a design engineer and he taught engineering design, but he's a very spiritual man and went to a seminar by his and he said, I have had these, what do you call it, these cards you can write out, what do you call them, note cards? What well, like uh, notelets or notelets. Index cards. Index cards, right, you yeah. Know, you know, about, about so big. And he said, I've been through the Gospels and extracted um, four promises made by God towards man. Mm. So you come up, take one of these and redeem the promise. I couldn't do it. Oh. A lot of people couldn't do it. Because that is a true act. So that was a shock for you. Tremendous. <laughs> well, burnt. And then I understood something remarkable that Benner said that, um, which was, you know, he, he was a Christian, obviously, he was so completely oriented that way. Uh, but he said the most important but worrying feature of the last 2,000 years is that man has not accepted his salvation. It's been the act of salvation, but man needs to accept it. And he has not done this. And he's still living in the old ways. Yes. And you look at it and go, what? <sighs> this is just to emphasize this act of receptivity is in you know, the, the words get tangled, receptive, you're just going to wait till something hits you. But no, this changes everything. And it's such a disaster in human relations, because you see in groups and trying to deal with things, you know, it requires, you can see it in a common sense of it, oh, it needs somebody to give way for things to move into a different way. Because mm -hmm. uh, nobody wants to give way. Because nobody wants to take this purely receptive role. Take on the burden. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. So relinquish, you know, so give something up. The, the, and this is, it enables it all to turn around and this kind of thing. So this, maybe I'm going on too much about this, but it's just to give it a, a context for this, of the reconciliation. What, what is this element which, uh, say, enables the, this act of receptivity to happen? And this was, you know, Bennett elaborated this in various writings and about the triads and all the rest of it. But in, uh, going back to Beelzebub and all that, I was, I still continued to be struck by the way in which there was a change. And I think I've got this, excuse me. You know, there was a 1931 version. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can get copies of that. It had different language and all of that. Uh, but one many di difference, one major difference between the two was this. In the first version, okay, he says in purgatory, actually, I think it's in purgatory, he says that the, the, he, Identifies the in in the because it's the, the the divine the theomot logos is the divine third force something like that you know so it's the third force in which is the third force of God which is the word of God and it's not an affirmation it's the third force but no let's just say take take that idea he said this third force takes part in every triad throughout the whole of creation. And the implication is that the will of God is involved in everything, everything. that happens. And that's quite a stunner. But if that is true, where does free will come in? Well, it's very easily. Explain. <laughs> I'm going get round to it. If I don't okay. do it, you can try me up. I want to say it first. Okay. In, the sec in the published version, you know, it only is there at the beginning and then the rest goes by momentum. Uh, going by momentum in the beginning is a, is a very standard traditional thing that goes back to people like Plato and all the rest of it. 
and in in certain miraculous where he's got that all fashioned with God absolute, he kicks start the universe and the rest cascades down and we're more than light years away from his Holy Son Absolute. So they've got nothing to do with us, see. And it was the extreme part. So all the beyond the first act of God, it's all mechanical. It's a really awful picture you know, I mean, But it's also in Hinduism in a certain form. Um, like that. But then in that but that first all and everything, when he got into the talking about God in a more more human way, he, it's not it's true he's saying this it's not just the first act of God, but every act has something in it. Now that gives the possibility to see a free will. In Model A, you just kickstart the universe, so to speak. No chance, it's all mish. You just starts working. It starts working, one thing leads to another, blah, blah, blah. And the first one, no, there's always this element in it. So it means that freedom is everywhere. But I associate my feeling is with the third force, is freedom. You know? So big enablement is freedom. So then we come to something which I, I shouldn't even, in words, attempt to say, I can explain or understand. You see, you see it's like it says that God, even God can't give free will, he gives the possibility of freedom. And it's kind of, people get very tangled about this because you can't reduce it to a, fact, so to speak. It just has to be made possible. Yeah. But then, you know, I know that then, you see, but it, that's why I wanted to have a chance of talking about it in this way, because of Mr. Goethe's way of reconciliation, because it, the first that contrast between the two versions of Beelzebub, which has a lot of significance within your question about freedom and so on, what happens in the work is this, you see, is um, it's like, wow, I'll say this, you know. We've been hearing people say, oh, I'm just speculating now so I can do it too. Of so, course. <laughs> speculate away. Speculate away. You know, so the, um, see, this is a question of, I, if you get, you see, if you get this, the picture that, uh, you know, this, if I'm allowed to say the third force of God is omnipresent, uh, so to speak, this means that in every act, you know, imagine you're involved in an act, I call it an act, in which is a coming together of these three. Um, you and God are not separate. So there's no problem about free will. Okay. You see? Mm -hmm. Because, and it's not saying there is God and there is me. I'm doing it in this way, so this is like God doing it through me. Not even God doing through me. I am God. Now this thing about I am God, probably heard about it in most traditions like that wonderful Sufi al Khalaj and he got um, executed for his effrontery by saying, I am no, God. God. Yes. You see what it because it come I believe it comes from this same sense, you see, about how things happen. You see how the quite common role of God creating a universe which is in some way other to him in a uh, very separatist way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I'm referring back now to Christianity because it has so strongly this issue. And of course, people are not Christians, hate it, and just like it, like Muslims hate it, um, will not tolerate the idea about Christ being as God. Because for them it's impossible to think that because Allah is totally other. You see, it's kind of the, but this, that God Himself could tread on the earth, um, we can't understand it, you know, and be crucified. This is something the Muslims hate. You know, they even have a story where there was a substitute which was crucified. That's right, that's in one of the uh, Lost Gospels as well, isn't it? A looky likey. 
<laughs> yeah, <sent> up. <laughs> yeah, you see, because he can't make And I think, again, back to this idea, and it gives a different idea of reconciliation to me, a much more stronger one, of, uh, uh, of God getting his hands dirty, mm. so to speak. And it, you don't really, well, you, all the other you know, great figures in Buddha, so you have a taste of this, but of course it's so extreme in Christianity, and I think it's possibly why Christianity is so rejected these days by a lot of people, because you know, they can't, it's too violent, it's too ex ex extreme. How is it possible for that which is the highest and beyond to be present in this contingent life, you see, in this kind of thing? You know, now, then I might have, if I'd done some homework, go in to look at all these, these uh, s sacred individuals which Beelzebub encounters or Gurdjieff talks about, you know, what is this situation sacred sent from above? See, that's the way he deals with it. He is, you see, which is kind of not as strong as and blatant as Christianity, but he has some, and he never quite, what does he mean sent from above? Um, dropped in this, um, I don't know, silly metaphor to like agents parachuted behind the lines. <laughs> <laughs> Sent down from the holy, holy son absolute or That's something. right. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine, and there's no sense of what this order would have been for them if sent from above like that, uh, in the sense of, um, which was, was really in principle for me the same terrible conundrums about Christ, how could it be God and man simultaneously? It was, this is absolutely impossible, you know, because he couldn't experience as a man if he had the God vision, you see, it would mm -hmm. be unfair. But the insistence in Christianity, and I really thank them for, was to adopt such a stupid and unimaginable and impossible thing, because that really put one on the spot and said, you know, you, this is something which is um, unique. On, but it's the same in mean, Buddha or Krishna or whatever, you know, and Zorasta. I mean, he had, because Gurdjieff was a different way in the ordinary life, he said, well, these are saintly people who come up with some good ideas, hmm. yes. moral principles, but in Gurdjieff it ain't like that, because you know, it's sent from above. So in a way, they, it's a cheat. But he had to be sent from above maybe because there was no one on earth Oh, right, doing yeah. It. They're, they're, they're doing what the earthlings can't do. What mm. is done from below is still sent from above. And so you think, what's going on here? Got this God doing all this kind of stuff. And then he's got to keep getting um, like troubleshooters sent down <laughs> to sort out <laughs> problems on the shop floor because he hasn't done it right in the first place. So it goes on and on like that. Um, um, this. Uh, it's as though he can't interfere himself, though, can he? He, has, he can't interfere himself, and that's why he has to send these others in from above. And you could say that with things like Christianity or any of the mm. religions. They, Alan never interferes, does he? He sends his angel down to speak to Muhammad. Um, I think that's the same right. with the well, Indian ones. Mm. They send various... Uh, I can't think of any examples down. Well, see, well, that's the... Radical thing, which of course goes just circumvents around, you know, because it goes down. Yes, God himself comes down. There are religions not, you know, like Buddhism, there is no God. In Islam, he would never come down because it's incompatible. You see, in Judaism, I think, much the same. Uh, but you see what I mean? It's just, uh, the extremes there. That's why I took a good way of reconciliation. I wanted to raise the looking at, you know, attention to this, what is it that, um, because, you see, this will of God thing, yeah, if you in, if you look at it from perspective of the affirming force, you get the creator God, the Old Testament God, the Yahweh, the Demiurge, and so on. But you look at it from the third force, it's quite different, you see, you, and because you know, you know about the conflict between the Gnostics and the Christians. Mm -hmm. You see, the Gnostics, this is a false world, it's a fake. And it's all made by the, like you say, the Demiurge, so 
That's fears. That's right. So. And you see, when he says this world of compassion, which is beyond this world, you see, you have to go through the illusion, break through the illusion and get to it. And there's a lot of sort of Gnostic feel in, in Gertrude himself. But the Christian said, you cannot have this, it's, it's one whole thing. And, uh, yeah, like, and some people actually cite it's in Genesis. I mean, the Indian seemingly primitive and extraordinary statements, da 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 da, and he saw that it was good. Now, uh, that's there as a major, it may seem material thing, but that's a major thing because it's, that contravenes the Gnostics and the dualists and all the rest because they're saying the existing world has goodness in it is itself. It's not but the perfection. Gnostics say in Genesis there's two creation myths, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. And there's, it's the second one that's the one that uh, the Demiurge made. Yes. With all the trouble and strife. All the troubles, <laughs> yeah. And like the reference I suddenly made just now to the Matrix, which is a very good presentation of it. But you see, if you take it from the side of the, side of the we, you, can, you get the creator, you see, as a maker. You mentioned the demiurge, and I want to add in here that, in general, because we've studied all these kind of mythologies and the language of it, the demiurge is associated with dealing with an existing matter or material. That's why his image in a lot of primitive stories is that of the potter. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you just take something and shapes Shapes it, you see. But that's why fiat you know, uh, fiat looks is creation ex nihilo, creation from nothingness, which we started with talking about. Talking about the beginning, Uh, yes. That's the real McCoy, and it was an important. uh, It must have been an important event. I I feel it was in human history because where it was localized, I don't know. Because imagine all early people were seeing something coming from something. You know, the earth, the animals, reproduction, the seasons, the soil, the whatever it was, everything was coming from something. And about where does this all come from? You see it. Um, but they probably didn't have the concept of something could come from nothing. No, I mean, it's very sophisticated. It's a, uh, because that period called the, the I forgot the, what's the period of the religions, you know, really from. Um, was really from Zoroaster to Muhammad and encompassing Buddha and so on. There was, yes, you can treat it as a tremendous workshop trying to deal with this kind of thing, but involving that nothingness. You know, in Islam, say, the laws of the universe are the habits of Allah. <laughs> oh, I've yeah. not heard that one. No, yeah, it's that. nice. Yeah. A lot of saying, isn't it? But I want to really have read David Holt about this thing about the reconciling. Um, term, you see, if, if it's going, another part of what I said, if you just look at it as solving the problem of sorting out the conflict, or between the plus and the minus, so to speak, I think that's the lesser view of it. I think a greater view of it is you know, around these ideas of enablement, because this addresses one, because in life you can see things in your life and so on. And, you know, you cannot do, you know, you cannot do this. Is, and, and then, where does this can-do come from? And you feel it's something, in, it has to be both independent of you, but also deeply you at the same time. And that's what I feel about the reconciling. So that's two, yeah, it's two forces coming together, isn't yeah. it? Well, it's not the much, you know, I'm just trying to see it in the same one. Because it, I want to lead it back, you know, lead it towards. Uh, I have a friend who's very keen on this, talking about this age of revelation and saying that um, you know, it's, there is a strand you see in spirituality. Steiner has it in one form, but I'm not sure about Goethe, but Bennett had it, which is that, you know, um, in truth, see, I mentioned I am God, but in, in truth, see, I am Christ. Um, and there is this option of dealing with that kind of unity, which is not like the one is taking over the other. It's the kind of unity in which the independence of, say, here, the human, is not annihilated, I'd like to say, you know, I've been overcome, you know, none of this overcomeness. It's something which can 
penetrate into the ordinariness of life. It's not like, I will achieve this God realization and all this kind of thing like Ken was talking about on the first night. And then, I think, as like the story I don't know if you've heard of her, Bernadette Roberts, no, which is an American mystic. I, oh, she just died recently. Incredible, you know, in, in the Catholic um, church, and she was a nun for a time, but she had a very religious upbringing, incredible insights. Uh, a few friends of mine met her and so on, you know, but she, uh, in her autobiography, in her statements, you know, I'm just quoting it, you know, she said at the age of 16 she had God realization. And then she sort of then said, oh, what am I going to do yeah. then? So she got married, had kids. <laughs> I've just lived a normal life. <laughs> That's right. If I'd done, done that, I mean, it sounds funny, mm. you know, but I can kind of appreciate it intellectually. And then she said, oh, well, now there is some unfinished business. I've got to get beyond God. Uh, and you think, what? <laughs> beyond God. <laughs> beyond God and God. And you get it in um, Sufism. Hassan Shushu, the way of Itlak Yolu, absolute liberation is towards God, in God, and beyond God, is the whole statement. You think, well, are these people arch lunatics? They're not even not satisfied with God realization, they've got to get beyond the, all that. You know, <laughs> they, and you think, what's going on here? But for me, this it's just a word, but it speaks to me of this wonderful, wonderful um, sense of reconciliation, the reconciling will. You see it as a reconciling will. So it's not reconciliation as the closure of the business, but it's the reconciling will, which is always new. So it's like what is beyond the nothing will oh, be beyond something the nothing, yeah. new. <laughs> you can look in the nothing and say, hi, friend, <laughs> what's new? <laughs> this kind of thing, you know. Um, so these, and, and for me it's a passion to cause the influence of Mr. Bennett, I mean, in many regards, the things I hear him say in his books you know, irritate me intensely. And in because he was a man, he had his bad hair days and his good days, you know, that kind of thing, and he went up and down. But he had a tremendous insight, you know. One thing, you've got to search for it, though, because people worry about, look, oh God, I had this experience, you know, I'm really sore, da da da. Then you say, and they, well, why can't I get back to it? I thought I saw something there. And I had a very deep experience when I was very young, about 18, something like that, and I was in the ideas. I was actually with a friend, and, and I was, something happened, and I was burst into tears. And I said, what is the matter? They said, because I knew, I said, I know I, I'm awake now, but I know I will soon be asleep. Mm -hmm. I will not be able to stop myself. In. And it really, it broke my heart, it really did. I never had it as clear and intense. You know, you're an adolescent and things are strong. Mm. That kind of so it's thing. like you were given that glimpse. Yeah, but I knew it would pass. Mm -hmm. All this would pass. But and most people go looking for that again and again yes, and again. And again. And uh, they can't find it and then they get disappointed, I think, and perhaps that's why they come off the path. That is true. Uh, and to introduce possibly another picture of view of that, that is to say that this attitude of, and it seems really perverse in a way, that attitude of taking the days when you're really stupid, you're just angry with everything, you're dulled out, you can't put two and two together and all that, and you think, what's the use of this? <laughs> yes. This is obviously bad. <laughs> you know? And we say, have a bit. And then you keep on imagining that, of course, that um, Superior people, you see, God, they don't have days like that. I think it's. But they do. They do. Yeah. Well, the blessed things that gave him one of my stores of heaven, he said, and I think I told you it once before, they were working on a pond at Coombe Springs and touching the waters. He came and in his very colored underpants, you know, and they started talking about holiness. And he said, you know, he said, maybe I'm a holy man, he said. And he interesting, he said, what is a holy man? Somebody who could enter into higher worlds at will. Mm -hmm. But he said, you know, holy men can always make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Well, it's because it's a struggle every day to stay holy. <laughs> yeah, or whatever. But it's, and they also say, he said that um, he said, people imagine I'm conscious all the time. He said, no, consciousness is a very precious substance. I'm only conscious when I need to be conscious. And I think, well, what? Because, you know, the ordinary punter's viewer said, oh, this consciousness is good. I want a lot of it all of the time. I don't want to be unconscious. Unconscious is bad. More consciousness is good. But better say, no, no, no. You've got all this multiplicity in ourselves because it's not to be defined in any one good, so to speak. You know. it's, it's not like that. But why do we get in these, you can look at any you know, reason about it, why do we get in these rotten states we can't see anything and think? Because if we can, in a sense, remember them we're in the high states and begin to put the two together, then we get understanding. Because if the, our understanding is based on having an energy and the experience, then it's still limited, it's subjective, you see. But if you have an understanding which is with you, when you're being stupid or silly, you know, whatever these words are, you know, mm. that's, the understanding has got to go through everything, even to these stupid things, so it's like a test. And so all these images you see of exile, separation, or they're enacted in us, in our lives, it's not just the A1 days, it's the Zeta infinity days. <laughs> the days when we act like fools and... Fools, you yeah. see, say, I'm a fool, you see. And so this, Benny could elaborate with his thoughts, he was wonderful schemes of hierarchies and he would go beyond and beyond and beyond and beyond, you know. But always he would turn around in the end and say, well, it's all here and now. Because the now is the only thing that matters, really, isn't it? This is, this is where it's at, and this is where the hieropass is at, and all of that. This is where it's at. Um, I mean, Jean, I mean, Gershwin was a genius. A lot of things he said about time and so on. But just everyone's got to find it in that moment. You know, you can see, like you and I meeting together. I mean, what? How did it happen? Why did it happen? I don't know. Hardly know. A simple thing like this, and um, wanted to add into our conversation about um, something I don't agree with. Is you, know, you get one side of Gurdjieff because all the stuff about um, nothing is accidental in objective art and all the rest of it. And um, I th my belief is that it's just provocation, and because as you mentioned Hazard earlier on, I think. Yeah, I'm talking, you know, it's after this hazard and mistakes and so on, which are crucial. And like scientists now are finding this out, you know, these, these old ideas of order and so on are extremely limited and they work only in certain uh, very stable regions of, of, of behavior and action and so on. You can do that, but they're more discovering more and more, you know, and things that are counterintuitive, like when you get something being communicated. It works better when you add noise to it, and you think, which is, wow, why? Why is there need for all that? So, I mean, go to this picture. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, intellectually, it's very one sided and wrong. Uh, but also, this exposure to hazard means, expo what does exposure mean? Why, I mean, you come to this room, I mean, I'm doing all the talking, I know. But you see, we started from this, we have a separation, we're not the same people. So, the whole universe has changed. You come into the room. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, you know, even these random interactions happening at this conference. Uh, this is, I, in a sense, where's that more than if you're going to sit in quiet in the morning or doing movements, whatever it is, but it's laid on. Because I, and I believe in my heart of hearts a bit that. Um, Gurdjieff really meant it when he said the work should be in life. It's the only way we do learn, isn't it? When we're actually out there mm -hmm. living our lives yeah. and then having to try to remember to put the effort in to be, well, yes, to be, while you're just doing normal everyday things yeah. and interacting with people yeah. that aren't in the, in the work. Or exactly. Um, I tried to 
do anything, make a cup of tea, whatever it is. <laughs> it doesn't have to be a, a deep thing. As I'm absolutely grateful for you for enabling us to do this experiment. It is an experiment, you know, and I'm really genuinely, I mean, I try to make a few notes, I try to remember what I wrote to the planning committee as my outline and all this sort of thing, but it disappeared because that moment in the year to really address what was real, which was you coming into the room. This was, that was reality. Mm -hmm. in, in what does it mean? So you, you take on from there. And, you know, even I do it now and I feel this something in my hands, you know, it's just weird. Because um, everything comes, it's really physical in a kind of way. But the, yes, I did. There was one point I did put into my memory to remember, and it's about this whole thing of work on oneself. Well, for me, in a way, to it formally, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to work on myself. And I, I, I see, I see, I picture myself like doing this, <laughs> or like Doctor Strangelove. So you're like trying to strangle yourself. They don't strangle pull us. your brains out. <laughs> yeah, and put it, you know, put inside my bootlaces with that kind of thing, or, or you know, tweaking. And of course, I can massage myself a bit and do this kind of work on stuff. But I began to think, well, the basic thing I do know, is, you know, is, is cooperating with other people working on you, just because there are other people and different, and other people are the pain in the neck and all the rest of it, and all the, <laughs> all the lovely little, whatever it is that I can understand, you know. And you might think in a pious way, you know, God works on us or something like this, you see, but I don't work on myself. I thought, I just, on a concept, I, did, I just don't get it, but I can see this is possible, you see, through the, the reconciling forces. To me, it tastes like that. That's all I can say, you know, because it's, um, because it's, it overcomes this causality in a way, because it's not one thing acting on another anymore. See, like that. Yeah. They're more working together? Working together, it's like, you know, and uh, in your new world, you you to say, um, you know, people say, why? You're making me angry, or what, it is, or what are you trying to do to me, and all this. You know, this primitive causality. But, you know, in a moment, you say, what? Like, what moves my hands now, you see? Um, and we know there's... We have a world and an education, and you... you, you know, the stages of subtlety in this, you, you get the... Within this scourge of work and so on, you get an exemplification of what I call a deviation into an alternative worldview. Because in the ordinary world as such, um, people living in these social roles and these mechanical roles and so on, and you go into this which maybe, helpfully, offers another perspective. And then you learn, oh, I have an essence, and what I have before was a personality. You know, and then you get into essence, then they, there's another stage, you get you know, the whole issue of individuality, which is, for me, where Christ comes into the picture because um, essence is not enough. You have to go that step higher, kind of. Well, it's higher, you see, and then you've got a question about the higher, and then it's something more real. And it actually corresponds. It came up to the reference to the third series and the two worlds and the third world, you see. Because um, you can take the first world to be the outer world and the personality, and the second world, the inner world, or essence. See, it's, if you look at the stuff, it's actually explicitly in Gertrude van den Bennett about how they, and he actually got these words for it, the true inner world is a third world. The second world, which is taken by people to be the inner world, is not. It's a, it's a fake world, too. And it's a, but the third world is a genuine inner world. Have a look at the, of the third series again. It's fascinating, this. So again, the third. And so when we learned with Bennett about action and so on, we go from this primitive notion of force or pushing 
and of course his subtlety of receptivity, as he did in his own work, going from the active ways of work to the receptive ways of work, you've got to be able to be helped. You've got to be receptive to influences. You've got to accept something for it to be really part of you. And these are not brave things, you know, heroic things, these, but these enable things to happen in you. And he was very great revolution for him to see raw effort and so on. But always remain complete because you've got to allow things to happen to you. You're done to you. And he knew that. But then you come to the third force and he said, What was the line of work of the third force? He called it manifestation. The perfection of doing whatever. Playing Hamlet, hosting a party, walking down the road. It's always there. What can only be always there is God. You know, it's not anything temporary in the human world or anything like that, or that's what I happen to think about the work or whatever it was, or anything like that, or anything in a book, whatever it's got to be in. What what can be present in every microsecond is, is God. And we can attain that. It's, oh, See, not, don't even have to attain it. We can realize that. Realize it. Yeah. Okay. Can, for me, it's very honestly, Debbie. It's very. I have a very dear friend who's, you know, who's my friend who's suffering from brain cancer, and he's so slowly dying. And uh, he's a devout Catholic and devotee of, of, of Mary, Virgin Mary, and he's been trying to write the last five, ten years about his idea about this being the age in religion of the age of will. Well, the notion about will, which is a Bennett notion, see, uh, imagine, it is that it's, it's, it's so abstract when you put it in the words, it's like the will is not divided by the one and the many, for example. You see, it goes, it will is actually beyond number. Um, and it's that which therefore can enable me to say, I am Christ, uh, without arrogance, and without it being based on an experience, or anything like that, and uh, you are Christ. And one day I could say this, and I hate you, but <laughs> you know, could st still do that. And one time I love you, and so on. And it's all around the circuit of a, a work on oneself, and I say, there is this work, and I say, I think for me, you see, the work is like, because I'm a Christian and I must identify, well, in terms of my language, because language has a big influence, you know, kind of thing. You say, do I truly believe in Christ? And I say, well, I don't know. <laughs> but the language is there. And I find this extraordinary myself because I've now reached a point where I can say things and somebody asks me, do you really believe in it? And I say, I don't know. but. They are said. The act of saying to me is sacred. Mm -hmm. you know, this kind of thing. So the, not the work on the circuit. And you say, well, this has been struggled with by religion, Christian religion, for a long time. And the, some idea that it's all predestined. Because how can we ourselves go against God's will, what he has in mind for us, and he's eternal, omnipotent. So the whole past is there, and we have to just accept it. It was very, very common, you see. The others, oh no, we have to do it all ourselves. And again, there's a need for this reconciliation. And I still as a struggle to find the language for it, you know, to, to, say, to allow this to happen in us. But that, you see, even that reintroduces some separation. There's some separate agency in me, like channel link, mm -hmm. and this kind of, it's not like that, because it's like, being more intimate, and you know, I do this and make a simple gesture, man, I really, really make this gesture, and this, what you're talking about, comes into operation. You know, it's with all my attention, all my effort and ability and so on. It's not just going gaga, being limp and picked up and going, ah, you know, or, or spouting something in a trance or anything. It's nothing to do with trance. And for me, that, that's what I'm struggling with now about the, the work and so on. I still I think a lot of this language is so archaic, um, and it's got, but it's got this contradiction in it. You see, 
it's really impossible. And this picture, Goethe's picture of man the machine, for such an entity to ever work on itself. Because yeah. we're too robotic. Yeah. See, where does this come in? You know, a few people smart. Daily King is one of those who struggle with this and goes, something interesting. But oh no, no. And what is it? Because you know that somehow it's just like this. It's a very ordinary story. Um, one day you're going on to the you go, oh, what about that then? You know, something comes, what about that then? Well, you actually read something and then you actually read it. And it goes, oh, because that would be true. You know, these little things, little moments, you see, and... Little glimpses of light. Light, yes. And you see, this is the grace of God touching me, I don't know. Um, but it's something which might enter into every particle. That's amazing. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, no, because it's, you see, who's, who's done this? I, mean, I, I remember once speaking, you know, I got the <laughs> brain with memories and all that, but you see, it is, what is the truth here? But I was the one that instigated it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you are. two different you see, forces. You see the different forces coming mm. together, and we have. Um, and what's from called? that comes the show, which is the third. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, and then you feel like feeling of goosebumps, <laughs> you know, going on. What is the time? Well, there? we've been talking for quite a while, so I think maybe we should call it a day. Okay. And I'd say thank you very much, Tony. Well, bless you for this. I, I was getting more and more worried. I thought, I can't. You know, I'm going to come up with... God, well... We'll come up with some wonderful things, and I think we can carry on this another time if we want to. Mm -hmm. But from That's Portland, amazing. Oregon, I think we should call it a day. <laughs> Thank yes. you. A day. It <laughs> is a day. The following